Hello and welcome back to Curiosity Mine and welcome back also to Lightning Ridge. This is Lightning Ridge. In fact, this is a lot of regional or outback New South Wales, at least as far as an ecosystem goes. We've got dry soil, we've got a rocky landscape, we've got scattered thin leaved bushes and a small number of very hardy but not necessarily very productive species of native plants that have evolved to live in this environment. But even then, they still struggle. This is semi-arid Australia and most of the time it can be a desolate dust bowl and that makes it all the more remarkable that this exists here. This is a little bit less than a hectare of what is effectively a tropical rainforest right in the middle of semi-arid outback Australia. And it's a remarkable thing, not only because it's here and we're looking at it, but because this literal oasis requires almost no maintenance and no watering. I spoke with Rebel, operator of the Hungry Spirit at Lightning Ridge, about this incredible project to basically terraform the landscape using completely sensible and very effective methods. So the Lightning Ridge climate is semi-arid because it receives, you know, 400 mil and below average rainfall every single year. Many years, particularly in the, the long-standing drought that we had prior to 2019, we were receiving sometimes only two to 300 mils. So even less rain than we would in a semi-arid classification. Semi-aridness isn't the only problem to contend with. So one of the challenges is the soil type that we have. It's very hydrophobic, which means that the water essentially, when it falls on it from rainfall it just runs off it and so we have a lot of clay plan areas where there's high compaction so there's very little opportunity for the water to filter down and get into the soil to then be able to create an ecosystem where there would be life growing and just the the fact that there's in areas there is just zero topsoil so there's nothing for anything to kind of take root in before it, it can get any traction it's just starting on um, concrete. I call what I have been doing for last 18 years, 20 years in my garden as jackhammer farming because I basically have had to jackhammer the ground in order to get uh, moisture and biomass starting to accumulate um, in, the, in the red dirt, which is reasonably high in nutrient once you get it going and once you get water into it. So we're dealing with low rainfall and poor quality or even no soil, which is a bit of a challenge. The solution came from the other side of the planet with syntropic farming expert Tiago Barbosa. So I met Tiago at a workshop hosted by a lady called Christine McDougal who teaches syntropic enterprise development. And I asked him what he did and he said he taught people how to plant water. And I said, well, you better come to Lightning Ridge because we haven't had rain in seven years. Tiago is a student of Ernst Gotch, who is a Swiss farmer working out of Brazil, who pioneered the concept of syntropic farming or syntropic agroforestry. Now, if you're anything like me, you're probably starting to zone out a bit, maybe glaze over the eyes a little bit, because all of this talk of syntropy is starting to sound like a game of pseudoscience buzzword bingo. But please stick with me because there's some really solid science backed up by successful regeneration and farming projects across arid regions of multiple countries. Plus, you know, this. So we made a plan and he brought some friends out to Lightning Ridge in June of 2020 and we planted that first system as the very first semi-arid application of syntropic agroforestry in Australia. Tiago has been working in uh, syntropic agroforestry for over 10 years, 10 or 12 years, under the tutelage of Ernst Gotch, who is the founder of the practice. And he, he's the guy that started growing this way, applying the principles, and then teaching other people how they might do it. Tiago has helped us build the systems that we've got. We run a couple of workshops every year that he comes out and teaches. And in those workshops, they're very practical. So we're planting, we're pruning, we're managing the systems, we're building new non-irrigated systems, as well as learning the principles of, of what syntropy and, and syntropic agroforestry are. It's super exciting and it's inspired work in semi-arid locations uh, in other parts of the world as well. And we're hoping it's also inspiring more work in the same, applying the same uh, methods in other semi-arid or arid areas in Australia. So in 
the Syntropic uh, agroforestry model, we're looking to replicate nature, but in a food system. So in a system that as human beings, we can grow food and also um, timber material as well. So you could be planting cypress, for example, in these systems to be harvested. Because we're growing a system that really is designed as a, um, as a demonstration site, and because it's the first time that semi-arid syntropic agroforestry has been done in Australia, we're really experimenting. But the fundamental principles are to capture as much water by as many methods as possible into the system. And obviously when we're getting low rainfall, we want to harvest and capture as much of that water that does fall from the sky free for us as we can. To put syntropic agroforestry into the simplest possible terms, it's leveraging what you can grow in order to grow what you want to grow. So instead of clearing land and planting your target crop in bare soil that needs a lot of water and extra fertilizer to support your crop, instead you use whatever will grow quickly and easily right where you are to start building an ecosystem in which you can grow what you need. So you build a structure of stable plants that support an environment in which your food crop will grow. If you need more moisture, you plant something that will grow and provide moisture. If you need more shade or temperature control, you plant something that maybe will develop a canopy. If you need more nutrients in the soil, then you plant something that will grow quickly and compost quickly and provide a boost to the soil. So you might start off with an inhospitable environment in which you can only grow, say, weeds and cactus. So you start by growing weeds and cactus. And then you cut down some of the weeds and you compost them and you let the rest grow to create an environment in which you can grow maybe some broader leaf plants. And then you let those create an environment where you can eventually grow your fruits and vegetables or whatever resource it is that you need. This is a massive simplification. All of this happens on multiple levels at the same time and at a really, really fast pace. But the basics are right. You use what will grow to create an environment suitable for what you want to grow. You replicate nature and guide it to build the ecosystem that you need. If you want to grow fruit or vegetables in an arid place, you'd start by encouraging the growth of trees, bushes, grasses, even pest plants like weeds, and even sometimes especially noxious or invasive species, but more on those later. But for now, Here's a banana tree growing in Lightning Ridge. Would you like me to show the banana tree <laughs> that we grew sure. in Lightning Ridge? If you're not sure why this is a big deal, it's because banana trees, as a general rule, do not grow in semi-arid rural Australia. If you ship a banana tree to Lightning Ridge, it will probably die on the way here. But here is a happy banana tree in the middle of a miniature rainforest at Lightning Ridge. This is um, two and a half years old and so we planted um we planted the system in june 2020 and then the bananas were planted retrospectively in september 2020 and we were very excited to see a little bunch of bananas growing there they haven't grown very much bigger in eight months but they're there so we're pretty happy about that bananas are amazing when you plant them you're just basically planting a chunk of the stem of one of the old bananas and you plant them upside down and then the roots come out and grow up. We'll be able to harvest these bananas out of this system and plant their babies essentially in other forest systems. So we'll become our own banana producers. We will be producing bananas for ourselves, which is pretty cool. One of the key factors in this type of farming is water conservation and designing a garden or a forest to maximize water retention in the biomass. So in the system design itself, we're looking to create an area of low density at the top of the system and an area of high density at the bottom, which essentially creates you know, a water funnel. So the water will um, go down the funnel and be captured in the landscape. We make sure that the trees that we're planting, the ones that will go high up into the canopy have low foliage at the top. And then we're making sure that at every level within the forest system, we've got bushier, shrubbier plants in the middle and then lots and lots of density at the bottom with strong grasses, bushy, bushy shrubs like the old man salt bush. We're using prickly pear and other cactus in the system for the same reason, just to create that density. And then we're also creating the wave in the system. So in the canopy level, we've got tall trees. The next row is a shorter row. The next row is a taller row. So we create that sort of wave in the system. We're really maximizing or optimizing the opportunity for water to be captured by the plants, by the um, soil um, and 
obviously in soil that is hydrophobic and runs water off it and is like concrete, um, we're really making sure that there's no bare earth at all because the plants will then do the job of getting the water down through their root systems, getting it into the ground and essentially building biomass. A garden or a forest or an experiment like this, whatever you want to call it, relies on all of the organisms inside of it living in symbiosis. That's the whole meaning of the word syntropy in this context. It just means everything is working together. So instead of thinking of a tree and a piece of grass and a parsley plant as all being separate entities, we need to think of them as one single item with all of the parts working in harmony or syntropy, I guess. Where we might picture a tree as this thing that pulls moisture up through its roots from the soil into its trunk and its leaves, we need to consider where that moisture comes from. It's coming from the biomass at the base of the tree. If you encourage that biomass to flourish, then the tree will flourish, which further supports the biomass. This is why the triangle or pyramid concept works so well. The more stuff there is at the base of a tree, the more undergrowth there is in the forest, the healthier the ecosystem and the better it retains moisture. Point proven here. There are a few elements of this type of farming that really require changing the way we think and maybe trying to forget what we've learned over the years of commercial farming. One of those things is the attitude that we have towards weeds. So in this entropic system we're really um, trying to flip thinking on its head around things that we would normally remove from the system, weeds or plants that um, we perceive don't have a purpose. In these systems we're cultivating them, we're you know, encouraging them and where we want to replace them we are replacing them over time with you know, seeding. So instead of spending hours and lots of energy to pull things out and remove them completely out of the system, we would instead put lots of seeds down that would grow for the future and then manage the grass, for example, or the weed much more harshly. And eventually over time, the other seeds will grow and will outgrow the thing that we didn't want in the system anymore. So in a syntropic farming environment, you need to grow some things that you don't really want in order to grow the things that you do want. In some cases, the things that you don't want are a bit more extreme than just some weeds. Prickly pear is being used in this particular semi-arid syntropic system for the purpose of uh, creating biomass. And it's also being grown as a water tank for the system. So for two, in two ways, one is that the cactus is mostly water, so large percentage of water. So when we do come into dry times again, which we will, we know in the cycles and seasons we do, we'll be able to chop this plant down and it will water, it'll feed the system with biomass but it will also water the system. But it also stores water within it that is then pumped into the soil when it's required. You'll see this actually happening in nature where there's a, a not not necessarily prickly pear but where there might be other cactus particularly you'll see it around lightning ridge next to the wilga trees very large sort of rectangular style of cactus that are growing right next to the wilga trees that's essentially the wilga trees water tank for dry times and they're working together symbiotically and you, you see them everywhere it's amazing Prickly pear, much like its more ferocious cousin, the Hudson pear, video about that one up here. Prickly pear is not only a weed in Australia, it's a rather noxious one as it spreads prolifically and in the conventional sense, it contributes very little to the natural ecosystem. So including prickly pear as such a deliberate and necessary component in a garden like this is obviously a little bit contentious. And lots of people get afraid. I mean, obviously planting prickly pear is frowned upon in most parts of Australia or all of Australia. In other parts of the world, it's not. It's actually a staple. We don't eat it, obviously, but we could if we needed to. It's very delicious. We're using it, obviously, for that particular purpose, but people always ask me what will happen, you know, will the plant be there over time and are we cultivating prickly pear to then grow in other places? The answer is yes, with a purpose in this system and with the knowledge and understanding that over time, as we build high-quality soil and as we build more biomass and greater density, density and as the forest ages, the environment will become so inhospitable to the pear that it will die. And we will know that we've done our job. And in the meantime, we use it to its best effect to help the forest essentially kill it off. It's like, you know, it's doing a job that will eventually be replaced. It's doing itself out of a job. 
when it's doing its job, if that makes sense at all. But it has a role in the ecosystem. It creates an environment that allows for other biomass to accumulate, for water to be stored, and over time it will die and it, it will have served its purpose. So this garden is merely a proof of concept. It's an experiment. It's a can we do this kind of thing. It's tucked away in the corner of Lightning Ridge in the midst of dusty dirt tracks and huge stretches of lifeless land with only scattered spindly weeds growing. It's a proof of concept that obviously works. This garden exists here because of a carefully calculated structure of different types of plants that all support each other to allow Rebel to grow, among other things, a banana tree that should only survive in a tropical environment and a scattering of healthy and thriving fruits, vegetables and even timber trees in a place where nothing, virtually nothing, naturally grows. The proof of concept works. What's really amazing is that we get these butterflies in this system that when you look up where they're meant to be is in rainforests. These huge black butterflies with amazing blue and white tips on their wings. We first found them, they just fly by. I'm like, wow, because they're huge. And we looked it up, sure enough, it's a rainforest butterfly. And we've got them living here in Lightning Ridge, which is pretty cool. Where did they come from is a whole other question, but they're very happy here. I wanted to create a beautiful green oasis in an outback semi-arid location. I did it the hard way for 15 years, 18 years, and then I discovered a different way, you know, uh, working with the principles of nature, working with the natural intelligence that exists in our ecosystem and learning to apply that in a landscape. And it's giving back to us tenfold what we would ever even consider putting in. And I think that's such an extraordinary gift. And if we can inspire and show other people that they can also do the same, regardless of their location, then I feel like the forest has an even greater purpose. And that's pretty cool. This video was made with the help and support of the Hungry Spirit at Lightning Ridge with special thanks to Rebel Black. If you visit Lightning Ridge, you should stop by the Hungry Spirit, which is also a venue space, a community center, and sometimes it's even a Thai restaurant. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to Curiosity Mine on YouTube and following along on all of the usual social media channels. And thank you for watching.